On the 1st of February 2021, the military of Myanmar staged a coup d'etat against Aung San Suu Kyi's government. As I'm writing this, Aung San Suu Kyi faces trial in a kangaroo court, which will probably see her imprisoned for the rest of her life. In a country where she gave years of her life fighting for democracy, will return to the brutal autocratic rule which has characterised most of its post-independence history. Unfortunately, this is nothing new. Since 1962, the nation has been under control of the military, also known as the Talmudor. In 1988, democracy protests did force the government to hold elections, but when they lost, they clung on to power and created a so-called disciplined democracy in their own image. In this video, I talk about the transition between 1988 and the 2015 elections to a so-called democratic rule and show how despite democratic posturing, Burma has never really shaken its military rule. Since the 1970s, the Talmudor tried to present itself as a more democratic regime than it actually was. Under the Burma Socialist Programme Party, they called themselves a socialist democracy, but this was quite transparently false, because not only were the majority of cabinet ministers either military or ex-military, but the leading General Ne Win just stopped calling himself General Ne Win and started to call himself U Ne Win using the uh, Burmese honorific term. And believe it or not, this wasn't quite the uh, cunning disguise that he thought it was. This all changed in 1988 when student protests about a mass currency devaluation led to the founding of the National League of Democracy which is Aung San Suu Kyi's political party. Now this seemed to change a lot of things because Ne Wing resigned from the government and he promised democratic elections but the military put down these protests and they also reformed themselves as the State Law and Order Restoration Council otherwise known as SLORC. Why Slork? According to James F. Guyot, the Slork had four main aims, which was the maintenance of law and order, the provision of efficient transport, the bettering of living conditions, and the holding of multi-party democratic elections. Now, as you've probably guessed, I'm going to focus on the elections, although I'm sure the transport reforms were just thrilling. Now, in this election, which was scheduled for 1990, the NLD would be pit against the National Unity Party, which was essentially an extension of Nawin's BSPP. The NLD was extraordinarily popular, which had a lot to do with the lady herself. Aung San Suu Kyi is the daughter of General Aung San, the beloved figure who negotiated for independence from the British in the 1940s, but was assassinated before having a chance to rule himself. His daughter had lived and studied abroad for most of her life, being educated in India and Oxford, and marrying an English academic. Destiny caught up with her when she was in Burma during the 1988 protests. Given a speech at the Shwedegon Pagoda, she became a symbol for hope and democracy in Burma. Throughout the campaign, Slork maintained martial law and put all sorts of restrictions on the parties. For example, Guyot writes that each of the parties only got one 15-minute radio address and 10 minutes on TV with a text that had to be approved in advance. The military also constantly undermined the NLD campaign by making up all sorts of rubbish about Aung San Suu Kyi, such as claiming she was a puppet of foreign governments or communist insurgents, and even claiming that she had some really weird, unsavoury sexual and obviously, under the martial law, the NLD could respond to none of this. It's no surprise, therefore, that the party shed doubt on the fairness of the entire process. When Aung San Suu Kyi was asked about what she thought would happen after the election, she said, we don't know. That's the problem. Whoever is elected will first have to draw up a constitution that will have to be adopted before the transfer of power. They haven't said how the constitution will be adopted. It could be through a referendum, but that could take months and months, if not years. That's why provisions for the transfer of power are so important. In campaign rallies, Aung San Suu Kyi was openly critical of the government and they cracked down on her even further. On the 5th of April 1989, she was nearly assassinated by a rogue group of soldiers who were about to shoot her when they were stopped by their commanding officer. Now, she wasn't perturbed by this and on the 21st of June, she held a rally to uh, memorialise the students who'd been killed in a 1988 protest, but this time the Talmudal were more heavy handed and they stepped in and killed a student and this gave her reason to pause. She planned another rally on the 19th of July to celebrate her father's life, however his status was so big that it gave her a really ample platform from which to attack the military and they were quite keen to get ahead of the narrative. Silverstein writes how they tried to control the ceremonies and invited her to join their leaders in marking the event but she refused, saying that she would honour her father in her own way. 
Tension around the event built up to the point that Aung San Suu Kyi just cancelled it, worried that it would evolve into another place where, like, you know, protesters and stuff would be killed. However, by this point, the Talmudor stepped in and arrested her anyway. With all this, you'd expect the National Unity Party to win the election, but they only actually got 10 seats compared to 392 for the NLD. In response, the government refused to seat Parliament, saying that the election only actually gave a mandate for a new constitution and not for a totally new government. In a press conference, they said, we cannot transfer power as soon as the elections are held. The elected representatives are to draw up the constitution. If the people approve that constitution, we will transfer power as soon as possible to the government which has emerged according to it. We do not want to hold on to power for a long time. Western countries weren't convinced. They placed sanctions on a regime and awarded Aung San Suu Kyi the Nobel Peace Prize, which was accepted by her sons. It took the Talmudor three years to open up the National Convention, and when they finally did, they set out six aims, which I'll just read to you now. Number one was the non-disintegration of the Union. Number two, the non-disintegration of national unity. Number three, the perpetuation of national sovereignty. Number four, the promotion of genuine multi-party democracy. Number five, the promotion of the universal principles of justice, liberty and equality, and number six, participation by the defence services in a national political leadership role in the future state. Now, uh, the only real difference between this policy and that of the uh, BSPP is the idea of genuine multi-party democracy, which had not only been somewhat undermined by all of the arrests throughout the 1990 campaign, but it also wasn't reflected in the National Convention at all, which had 702 members, with only 99 of them actually being elected parliamentarians, and the rest of them being handpicked by Slork. Um, it's important to say as well that while it must have been the policy of the pre-1988 Talmudor to uphold these principles of law and everything, they probably didn't follow them, um, but they would have said that they did. So, you know, the policy's not changed, even if the actions didn't reflect what they said. Opposition groups and ethnic minorities kicked up such a fuss that it took a year for anything to actually get done, and when it did, it pretty much showed where the Talmudor's mind was at. Their first big action was to ban anyone with a foreign spouse or foreign children from becoming president for, you know, reasons. And also their second act was to guarantee the military 25% of parliamentary seats for, you know, other reasons. Now both of these policies continue into the modern day, which is a reason that even though Aung San Suu Kyi was the head of the government, she wasn't actually given any title like President or Prime Minister. In 1995, Aung San Suu Kyi was released from house arrest and she continued to agitate against the regime, pushing for foreign sanctions and a tourism ban. There's a lot of interviews with her at the time of her basically making fun of the regime, for example this one from 60 Minutes Australia. The people that we've spoken to still seem to spit out the expression, the lady. Oh, I see. <laughs> but at least they say lady for a change. <laughs> there were lots of other expressions that could have been noted, is that right? Exactly. Mm. Assumedly to counterbalance this reputation, it was in this period where the Slork began to put on a more uh, civilian-friendly face again, and they renamed themselves the Less Threatening and Less Ridiculous State Peace and Development Council. It was also in this year where they officially renamed the country to Myanmar. Now, in my last video, I made a little bit of a mistake with this, and I said that in the 1970s, they'd renamed the country Myanmar in the constitution because of, uh, you know, ethnic minority tensions and wanted to unite them. But it turned out that Myanmar is actually just the uh, formal written version of the word for Burma, and they both mean the exact same thing. And the military wanted to change it to like, you know, make it more formal and uh, also to break away from British imperial rule. However, Aung San Suu Kyi would continue to call the country Burma as she thought that calling it Myanmar would feed into the idea that the Talmudor was a legitimate government. Despite the SPDC's attempt at creating a softer image for themselves, they continued to stifle dissent. In November 1996, Aung San Suu Kyi's car was attacked by a group of supporters of the Talmudor while a bunch of soldiers stood on the sideline and watched. As well as there being soldier bystanders, we know the Talmudor was responsible because, as CNN said at the time, such large gatherings in a public place are illegal under military law unless government permission is obtained. One of their most personally vindictive moments came in 1999 when Aung San Suu Kyi's husband was back in England and dying of cancer. 
Now he applied for a visa to come and see his wife but the Talmudal refused despite the fact they hadn't seen each other for three years and despite the fact that obviously this would be their last chance. Now it's believed the Talmudal had hoped that if they didn't let him into the country Aung San Suu Kyi would go back to England to look after him and then you know she wouldn't be allowed back into the country and their attitude to this has been summed up like this. The state media turned the tragedy around to use it as a weapon against the pro-democracy leader, claiming that her western supporters were taking advantage of the cancer-stricken plight of an ordinary person to make the SPDC look bad, and that if she had any true Myanmar blood in her, she would go to England to take care of him. Between 2000 and 2002, Aung San Suu Kyi was put into house arrest again, and then in 2003 she would face her third major assassination attempt, which would become known as the Depayin Massacre. Now, what happened here was her entourage was travelling between two towns when they were stopped by a pair of Buddhist monks who asked her to come out and address their gathering. Now, when she agreed to do this, they turned out not to be who they said, and a bunch of supporters of the Talmudal came and attacked her and her entourage, and they killed over 70 people, and after this, Aung San Suu Kyi was arrested for a third time. With their great rival out of the way, the SPDC released their so-called Roadmap to Democracy, which essentially laid out their plan to finish the transition to their military-loving discipline democracy, which they'd been pursuing, and as well as this, they gave themselves a whole range of new powers, such as the power to dismiss parliament, such as key ministries in government, and such as the power to declare states of emergency. On the 9th of February 2008, the Junta announced the dates for a constitutional referendum and for the 2010 election. Now, as an NLD spokesperson pointed out, they were kind of jumping the gun by announcing the two of these at the same time, seeing as you couldn't have an election without the referendum passing first. But this is just a small piece of evidence as to how the Junta really did not care about democracy. On the 8th of May 2008, Cyclone Nargis hit Burma a week before the referendum. On the first day, 10,000 people were announced dead, but despite the scale of the tragedy, the Junta initially refused foreign aid and refused to delay the referendum. Barely anyone had read the constitution, but luckily despite that, 99% of people turned up in the middle of a cyclone and delivered 92.4% yes votes. That is if you believe the Talmudor, however, if you believe Human Rights Watch, and you'll probably see this as an insult to the people of Burma. The extremely popular NLD had campaigned against the constitution, making it extremely unlikely that it would have had that many people in favour of it. And according to the BBC, in some villages, um, the authorities and polling station officials were ticking the ballots themselves and did not let the voters do anything. The NLD boycotted the 2010 elections and the Western nations maintained their sanctions. Writing in the New York Times, the Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg said these elections will be neither free nor fair. Opponents of the ruling party lack resources and are systematically targeted by the current regime. Thousands of political prisoners remain incarcerated, various ethnic parties have been refused the right to participate, and last month the military dissolved the National League for Democracy, its biggest perceived threat. In a surprise to absolutely no one, the Talmudal's Union, Solidarity and Development Party won a stonking big majority. A week later, Aung San Suu Kyi was released from prison without conditions. While she continued to push for democracy, this time the USDP agreed to enter talks with her. While previous talks between the NLD and the Yinta have been described by Aung San Suu Kyi as leaving her in limbo, these ones seem to be a lot more fruitful with the NLD not only being able to participate in by-elections in 2012, but being able to win seats and take them up in Parliament as well. Now there's a fair few uh, disagreements over why this actually happened, but a lot of them say essentially that sanctions had absolutely nothing to do with it. Take this passage for example. Myanmar has been under sustained domestic and international pressure to carry out sweeping political changes which would result in the establishment of an elected civilian government. This has been a price for any substantial foreign economic cooperation and assistance. As no substantial moves have been made in that direction by the ruling State Peace and Development Council, Western governments led by the United States have seen fit to progressively increase the levels of economic sanctions applied to the country in the apparent belief that this will result in international isolation, economic collapse and eventual fall of regime. However, I've not really seen any strong evidence for other reasons that this could have happened because the Talmudal knew that all they had to do was allow the NLD to compete and then the West would lift their sanctions and they didn't really need to cede over any power considering the massive amount of power they had granted by the constitution. In 2015, the NLD competed in and won the general election. The Economist wrote at the time, the election is not entirely fair. 
Voter lists are inaccurate and ripe for abuse. In some violent areas, voting will not take place at all. Meanwhile, perhaps one million Muslim Rohingyas in a largely Buddhist country have been deemed stateless non-persons ineligible to vote at all. Despite this though, because Aung San Suu Kyi was allowed to compete and because she won, the West thought this was good enough and they lifted sanctions. Thank you so much for watching, this is Waibo Joe, it's a channel where I talk about history, current affairs, politics and things like that. If that's your cup of tea, which I assume it must be because you're here, then why not click subscribe and ring the bell and that way you know the next time I make a video. For this video I basically had a bunch of research as well for the Saffron Revolution, which is a really interesting little thing that happened in 2007, but it didn't really fit into the video so I've left it out and I'm either going to make another short video on the topic or I'm going to write about it in my weekly column on We Are Writers which you should totally check out as well. They come out every Wednesday and I cover all sorts of stuff. It's very good. It's a very good column if I do say so myself. Um, and yeah I'm going to make more videos on Myanmar as well but first I need to make something a bit shorter.